Hello, uh, I'm Aja Hammerly. I am from Seattle, like Aaron, who will be talking yes tomorrow. Um, uh, I am Thagomizer on GitHub, the Thagomizer on Twitter, and I blog at thagomizer.com. And I like dinosaurs a lot. Um, Thagomizer is that spiky part at the end of a stegosaurus. Uh, I was gifted the domain name by a partner at the time almost 10 years ago, and it just kind of exploded from there. I even have Thagomizer earrings now. <laughs> so uh, I work at Google on Google Cloud Platform as a developer advocate. And I have many answers and questions and opinions about how you can run your stuff on Google Cloud Platform. Come find me. I'm happy to chat. And because I work at a really big company, uh, I have to have this slide. The lawyer cat says that any code in my slide is copyright Google and licensed Apache V2. So NLP. This talk is about NLP. And you might be wondering what that is if you didn't just hear the answer. But specifically, it's natural language processing. I get to a little bit closer to understanding what this talk is about, but it's still a little bit fuzzy. So let's see what Wikipedia has to say. Natural language processing is a field of computer science, artificial intelligence, and computational linguistics concerned with the interactions between computers and human natural languages. And in particular, it's concerned with programming computers to fruitfully process large natural data corpora. And that definition is really long and has a lot of big words. So here's the definition I actually use. Natural language processing is teaching computers to understand and ideally respond to human languages. And human languages are things like English, Japanese, uh, Chinese, American Sign Language, British Sign Language, basically any languages that humans use to communicate with each other. So why should I care? This is you know, echoing thousands of thousands of children everywhere in school when having to learn things. Why do, when am I ever going to use this? And the big reason is it's already here. Um, NLP is here and has been already here for decades. Uh, when you call up an airline and try to use a voice-activated phone tree, and you're sitting there in a parking lot screaming, reservations, 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 and it's only sort of understanding you, that's really bad NLP. Um, when you ever you chat with a, an agent in a chat window on a website, I had to this morning working on some flight reservations, there isn't actually a human involved. That is also NLP. This particular website said that the agent's name was Jennifer. No, there wasn't actually a person there. One of the big promises of NLP is better user experiences. Instead of having to teach ourselves how we interact with a computer, we can teach the computer to interact with us in ways we already know how. I don't know how many of you have had the pleasure or pain of trying to teach someone who's not particularly computer literate how to do something. And it's clear that if it could just work with the way their brain works, you wouldn't have to sit there and play tech support. But it doesn't. And so NLP is potentially a way for us to get there. So one of my favorite examples, it isn't good NLP, but it's a great example of NLP that's been long around for a while, is if you say something like computer, T, Earl Grey, hot. No one gets my Star Trek joke. That makes me sad. <laughs> um, I also have one of these at home. And how many virtual assistants are there out there? Like, I moved in June. And I don't actually know where all the light switches in my new place are, because I just shout at the computer to turn the lights on all the time. It's fantastic. And these are becoming more and more and more popular. And then there's one I already mentioned, which is tech support and phone trees. So hopefully, at this point, you believe me that NLP can improve user experiences. But there's another way that NLP is helpful that you may not have thought of, which is accessibility. So voice interfaces are important because they can be more accessible than text for some people. For example, those who can't write uh, because of disabilities and or uh, physical and or uh, cognitive. They can also be helpful if your hands are busy. Right now, both of my hands are busy. I could not write anything. And they also can. Um, but the other thing to know is that voice interfaces can also reduce accessibility for other users, people who can't speak. So NLP is good. It can help us. It can make computers easier to use and can make our lives better. But that isn't the only benefit. NLP also helps us improve our understanding, especially of large, huge piles of text or speech. 
So maybe you work on a website where you get feedback from users. When I was at a startup, we had a feedback button on every page, and it was a startup making software for children, so we got feedback from five-year-olds, and it was fantastic and hilarious. Five-year-olds do not hide their opinions about your software at all, and they have some of the best insults ever. <laughs> um, but you can also use it for things like reading through investor briefings or all sorts of those really long, crazy documents that companies use to try to hide important information. We can use things like NLP to help us understand those faster so we don't have to read them ourselves. And it can use to be assist us in other ways. Uh, one of my coworkers made a tool called Deep Breath that analyzes your emails as you're writing them in Gmail. And if what you're writing if comes off as hostile, it tells you to take a deep breath before you send it, which is super handy. Imagine how many GitHub flame wars could have died before they even got started if everyone had a tool like this in, uh, set up. So NLP is useful, but we don't have it yet as widely available as we'd like. And what we do have isn't great. Um, the number of times that I have screamed at the computer, no, the bedroom lights. No, the bedroom lights. Turn on the bedroom lights. And it's just like, OK, and then turn something else on and com uh, com com completely different. Way too high. And that's because NLP is hard. Well, why is that hard? Um, and largely because English is horrible. It's a horrible, horrible language. Uh, and to prove this to you, I have this wonderful word right here. So the word is seal. Everyone imagine what that word is. It's a noun. I'll give you that. How many of you guys thought of something like this? Yeah, I mostly included this because I really, really liked this picture. <laughs> How many thought of something like this? How many thought of something completely different that I don't have a picture of? Yeah. There's a lot of different meanings for that one word. And without context, and even with context, sometimes it's hard to figure out what you're talking about. Another great example is homophones. There, there, and there. Yeah, those. They all mean different things. And then there are words that can be multiple parts of speech. Love is a great example. He loves his wife. And love lasts forever. In the first one, love is a verb. In the second one, love is a noun. But it's the same word. How can it be multiple parts of speech? And there are many other languages that don't let this happen. By, you, by adding things to the end of words or changing how vowels work out, the part of speech is indicated. But English is really, really bad, really horrible at this. So English is horrible. And I really didn't even get into things like irregular verbs, slang, idioms, and all the other bits of language that make a human language a human language. But it turns out that English isn't alone, because all human languages are horrible. They're horrible in these ways or in different ways. Every language has weird, interesting things that you only understand once you learn the language fluently. If nothing else, every language has idioms. And one of the big things that makes human languages hard for computers is because there are no formal closed grammars for human languages. Who follows the phrase formal closed grammar? Raise your hand. OK. So that means that I can't basically make a flowchart for how to make a valid sentence. Like, there are lots of ways to throw words together. It isn't as bad as some other languages where there are no, where there's no word order. Just, you know, wherever they feel good. But there's no, there's no flowchart that I can make to make valid sentences in the English language or in many, many human languages. Um, but Human languages are hard, and they're much harder than computer languages. It's really easy for me to make a flowchart for how to make a valid phrase in Ruby, for example. And one of the other big challenges is that NLP is hard because humans, we're kind of really bad at precision. For example, I could say, I'm starving. It might be true, but probably not. I could say, you look freezing. Also, maybe but most likely not. And then I was reading the other day in, uh, I believe it was the New York Times, that the word unique is getting less unique over the last 30 years. There's a good probability now when someone says unique, what they actually mean is unusual. Instead of 30 years ago when they said unique, they actually meant unique. It has gone up like six-fold in its use in printed word in English uh, newspapers and other publications in the last 30 years. So language is constantly evolving, which also makes it hard for us to write programs that understand human language. And my last example is computers are really bad at sarcasm. So I could say, sure, I'd love to help you out with that. 
Sounds pretty sin sincere. I'm not being a jerk in this case. But if I said, sure, I'd love to help with that. You can tell that I'm being sarcastic in this case. But there's no actual difference in the words. The only difference is in my tone of voice and my pitch. The meaning of the sentence changes based on how I say it or on the surrounding context. And despite what we learned from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, computers are really bad at sarcasm. So, why is this hard? This is hard because humans. Humans use language in weird ways, like sarcasm and exaggeration. It's hard because English is complicated, and all languages are complicated, and they're always changing. But since humans created human languages, we can just simplify all this and say, NLP is hard because humans. So I'm going to dive a little bit into the history of NLP right now. Um, we've been doing this for a really, really long time. Who recognizes those two, those two names? Possibly from a calculus class near you, yeah. Uh, both Leibniz and Descartes proposed ways to do algorithmic translation between languages. And when I travel, one of my absolute favorite things in the world is the Google Translate app on my phone where I can take a picture and it tells me what things say. Like it was fantastic when I was last time I was in Japan. It is so handy. But we've been working on this, that very idea, since the time of Descartes. So, this is not new, and it's taken us a really long time to get to a point where it even sort of works. Uh, another great example of NLP is the Turing test. Who thinks they know what the Turing test is? I thought I did too. I was wrong. So this is from the 1950s. Uh, the way this works is you're testing to see if a machine is intelligent. So you have a judge, and they're watching a conversation between a human and a machine. They know that there is one human and one machine, but they don't know which one is which. If the judge can't tell which one is the human or which one is the machine, the machine passes the Turing test. I always was under the impression that it was a human is conversing with a machine and doesn't realize they're talking to a machine. But the actual version proposed by Alan Turing was the judge, a third party, is trying to figure out which of two people in a conversation is a machine. People. Um, and then there's the other famous example of Eliza. Uh, who uses Emacs? I use Emacs. Emacs is awesome. You should use Emacs. Um, if you go MetaX Doctor, you can let you play with it in real time. Eliza is the computer psychologist, and this is also late 1950s, early 1960s. It's surprisingly good considering how little code is actually there, uh, and the fact that it's written in Lisp. So, but Eliza was really the first of the chatbots. Who's written a chat bot, or a Twitter bot, or a Slack bot, or something? I wrote one. It went and pulled cute stuff from r aw on Reddit and posted it into the channel. It was fantastic. So, I've talked a lot about history. I've talked a lot about theory. So, I'm here actually to talk to you guys about some codes. Um, one of the things that I normally do when I get on stage is I really hate giving pr practical and useful examples because I'm afraid that people are going to go use the stuff that I crammed onto a slide and think it's production worthy. It's not. It's never production worthy. Production worthy code doesn't fit on slides. So I'm going to give you impractical examples. Uh, the first one is Twitter. Uh, at RubyConf in the US in 2015, I gave one of the keynotes. And the talk was called this. It was stupid ideas for many computers. In that talk, uh, actually based on a talk that Aaron and Ryan did in uh, 2011, something like that, when they were writing the fail bus together. And I wanted to take all of those ideas and try to do stupid computing at scale. So in that talk, I demonstrated how I could do sentiment analysis of tweets by scoring the emoji that they contained. It was a really bad idea. Let's just make this clear. This is a horrible idea. So sentiment analysis is the process of computationally identifying and categorizing opinions based uh, in opinions in a piece of text, especially in order to determine whether the writer's attitude toward a particular topic, product, etc., is positive, negative, or neutral. This is something that a lot of brands use on their social media streams to figure out how people are feeling about their product, either in response to an ad campaign or you know, airlines in response to storms that are causing delays, things like that. Um, so I decided to use emoji because sentiment analysis is really hard. So I made a scale. On one end, you have the like purple angry guy, and he's negative 30. And then there's the boop emoji, which is negative 15. And the smiley face is positive 30, and so on. And I used emoji because it's much, much easier than actually doing it. But it turns out that since I gave that talk, we've gotten better. We've gotten access to better tools. And one of the things is I work at Google, and we released the Natural Language API 
So I'm going to show you how this would work with that instead of my really horrible emoji-based system. So you can get access to this gem install Google Cloud language. Uh, it's currently in alpha. It's going beta shortly. Yes, I have been told it was actually supposed to be beta by today, but we found something we didn't like, so we're fixing it. Um, and the code's actually pretty straightforward. You require it. You create a new language object. And then I've got this analyze method that takes in the text of a tweet. And I'm like, OK, language, your document is the text of this tweet. And then I'm like, hey, go get me the sentiment. And it goes off to the server. And the server's like, here's your sentiment. And then the sentiment has two things. It has score and magnitude. We're going to just look and listen to score. And so I care about that. And it gives me a number between negative 1 and 1. It's fantastic. So I'm going to vigorously hand wave over how to do this at scale. There is a small distributed system that runs a thing called Rinda. It's set up using Kubernetes. If you want to talk to me about it, come find me afterwards. I'll walk you through it. You can also watch the talk. The video is up on Confreaks, and I actually watch, walk through the whole architecture. And the source code's all online if you want to try to analyze a bunch of tweets. Sure, do that. Awesome. But the big thing is, is that I took what well, used to be about 30 lines of code, and I've managed to take it down to three lines of code by using a model that's been trained to do sentiment analysis by someone else. Yeah, I could write sentiment analysis code in Ruby, but I like, I'm lazy. I'm fundamentally lazy, and I like to keep things easy. So I'm using someone else's library for it. The other example I have for you today is sentence diagramming. Um, when I was in school, I had to do a lot of things that looked like this. I had to figure out what the subject and the verb of a, of a sentence were. I had to separate them with a big line versus a direct object. That was half a line. And like other words went at crazy angles. Um, this was something that I did in grade seven all year, no matter how much I hated it. I think it was technically useful. I don't know why. It was just part of you know school where I went to school. Uh, one of my friends did all his this way, kind of doing an abstract syntax tree of English. Um, ew, grammar. So I was talking to some folks about how excited I was about, to, about giving this talk. And they were like, I don't actually remember any grammar at all. So I'm going to you know, do a quick side quest. My guess is that this will be a, uh, uh, a refresher for some of you. And for most of you who are like, what, why did your friends not know this stuff? Well, the answer in some cases is because my friends are uh, monolingual, and you don't learn grammar as well unless you know multiple languages, in my experience. So real quick, parts of speech. Uh, this is one of the ways we understand words. We label them with what they do. So we have verbs. Verbs. Verbs are the most important part of a sentence. You can't have a sentence without a verb. One type of verb is an action. Jump. You could also have a state of being. Think. Thinking. Uh, nouns. Nouns are a person, like Matt's or Alan Turing, a place, like Malaysia or bathroom or a building, or thing, like a bird or a goat. I met this goat when I went hiking. It was pretty cool. Uh, but nouns can also be ideas. So you may have heard the phrase abstract noun. Um, some examples are democracy, freedom, love. Those are all abstract nouns. You can also have adjectives. They describe or modify other words, usually nouns. It gets complicated. But there are things like attributes, blue, small, five. They also help us compare, like near and far. Uh, you also have articles, a, an, and the, which are sort of adjectives and sort of not. And they don't no longer call them articles. They now call them determiners for reasons that I don't understand. Determiners also include this and that. All the articles are determiners, not all determiners are articles. So yeah, that was all the parts of speech that I care about for today. We also have the parts of a sentence. The root, this is the only required part of the sentence, which means it's the verb. Then we have the subject, which is the thing that does the verb. Gorilla thinks, Aja speaks. And then there's the direct object, is the thing that the verb happens to. So the cat eats fish. Cat is the subject, the root is eats, and the direct object is fish. Side quest complete. So back to sentence diagramming. I promise this was actually important. Um, so this is basically how a rough sentence diagram works for the kind I used. In order to draw these diagrams, I need to figure out which part of speech or part of the sentence each word is. 
To do that, I need to use syntax. The Natural Language API has a method called syntax. So my normal boilerplate, and then I have a document. I'm going to tell it that we're going to work on the sentence, the cat ate fish. And I go, hey, document, give me the syntax of that. And then I have it print out the tokens. And I get this crazy pile of stuff. This is the token for the word cat. And there's way more stuff here than matters. Like There's ideas of grammatical gender. English doesn't have grammatical gender, so that's kind of irrelevant here, because this, of course, works on multiple languages. But the important thing is that here's the text itself, cat. It is four characters into the string. That is its offset. Here's the part of speech. It is a noun, and it is singular. I can also have case if the language has case, but we're not doing German or other languages with case, so we're not going to do that. And then this is the most important part. This token is labeled uh, n sub for norm nominative subject, which is basically just saying that cat is the subject of the sentence, which is good because cat is the thing that eats fish. So I was able to write some code that created ASCII art versions of the sentence diagrams, and it's really simple. I'm going to find the token that's marked the nominative subject, and I'm going to save that as sub. I'm going to find the token that's marked as the root and save that as verb. And then I'm going to do some crazy ASCII art with puts and, you know, some math, and it's awesome. So, uh, the one thing, yeah. yes. So the last line there is a cool trick I learned. Um, you can multiply a string by a numeric uh, in order to make sure that everything is spaced properly in this case. So, rock and ASCII art. But that's kind of boring because I don't have all the words yet. So now I have direct objects. Well, I go find the direct object in the tokens and save that off and change my ASCII art up a little bit. And then I get the cat ate fish. Oh, wait. Well, I'm missing the. So how do I include the? So I have to actually look at that, the results from the Natural Language API. And I get a head token index for each word. This is the index of the parent of the current token. So this is the token for the. Its head index token is 1. If I look at the array of tokens, the cat eats fish, period. Uh, the thing at index one is cat. So this is telling us that the refers to cat. Someone writes some really bad code. Um, tokens, go through them all. If a token's head index is the subject, I'm going to print the text of that token, yes. And with that, I can make this diagram. Yay, all of my words. So let's make this a little more, little more uh, challenging. So now I have the cat ate fish with a side of milk. Um, yeah, my code doesn't work at all on that, at all, even a little bit. So at this point, I jumped ship and switched to my old friend Graph. This was the, actually the gem I gave my very first conference talk about in 2007, something like that, eight. Um, the graph gem is a gem that makes creating uh, node and edge graphs, graphs like graph theory, not graphs like bar charts. Um, it provides a DSL in Ruby to create uh, dot files. Dot files are the file format that GraphViz uses to render graphs. So some simple graph stuff. Uh, you create nodes by calling a node method. You pass an ID and a label. You create edges by calling the edge method with a from and a to, and it draws the arrows. So here's the code. It's actually relatively simple. This is all the code you need, oddly enough. Um, this is some graph boilerplate. This drops me into the graph DSL. I'm going to go through each of the tokens with index. I'm going to make a node, specifying the index and using the text span text as the label. And unless its head token index is itself, so unless it is referring to itself, the only thing that does that is the root, I'm going to draw an edge from my node, i, index, to its head token. And that gives me this. The refers to cat, cat refers to eight, fish refers to eight, and the period refers to eight because it's the root. But I can also use my more, my more complicated example of the cat ate fish with a side of milk, and it works as well. And you can even see that uh, of milk, the prepositional phrase there is labeled correctly. Uh, everything is all laid out exactly the way you would expect it to be. So, I showed you some really silly examples today, but there are lots of practical uses for NLP. Handling customer feedback, better understanding language, summarizing things for humans to read. I'm sure that some of you have your own ideas on how you could use this at home. So if you just want to stick your foot into NLP, the Google Natural Language API is a good place to start. You don't have to go in and learn all the algorithms. You don't have to 
Make sure that you build separate models for different languages. Many, many languages are actively included. Um, and the first 5,000 a month, uh, first 5,000 requests a month are free. Uh, getting started is easy, just install the gem. And you can experiment. I actually ran the Jabberwocky through it just to see what it would do, because I'm at heart a tester. And it actually got the syntax analysis exactly correct. So it's not based on just vocabulary. It's based on the structure of the language and endings and all sorts of other things like that. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, I like dinosaurs. Come on. So I have a ton of dinosaur stickers and a bunch of Google stickers of various kinds in my bag. I don't want to take them back home to the US, so come, come find them for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aja. All right, uh, we, we're going to take some questions. All right, come on, guys. What questions do you have on uh, analytics? Processing so right. the first two speakers didn't get a lot of questions, so I'm going to promise you that I will show you a picture of a cat if you ask a question. <laughs> it's hard to say no to that. Come on, there's an obvious question. Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah, we've got two. Uh, Aaron first. Can I see a cat? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> Raja, do you have a real question? Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> uh, so you say that the English language is bad, right? It's horrible. Uh, but so if uh, a super intelligence AI is able to create language that will that it will use to communicate to other AI, how does it? How do you think it will look? So the question is, uh, English is hard. What would a super intelligent AI that could actually uh, create language? Because you'll notice that everything I talked about today was analyzing human language. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't creating spontaneous language. How would a super intelligent AI look? I don't know, actually. I know that we're getting closer and closer to having really complicated AI. But at the end of the day, and I've been working on a, a blog series on basics of machine learning, uh, we are we are it's still at this point, for the most part, blocked by our data sets and blocked by our ability to create algorithms. There's a really interesting field that's coming up in algorithmic bias and how we're limited by the data that we have access to. So I actually have no idea what it would look like. And I'm a little bit afraid because there's been so many horror movies written about that. <laughs> Here's your cat. I read an article about two robots conversation between themselves. And at a certain point, they just uh, on a certain point, they just stop conversation in English. And instead of saying, give me three pieces of that, they say, me, me, me. So they like, repeated three times what they wanted from, from the other robot. So. You, you said you watched that in a movie? No, no it's an article. It's oh, okay, okay, an article, okay. Okay, yep. It's a good one. <laughs> All right, okie dokie. One last question. Shin? No. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. He was pointing at you. Um, so, if I understood that right, you're basically using Ruby to consume natural language processing that Google is talking about. Are you using Ruby itself for any natural language processing? So, the question was. Uh, uh, the question was, am I using Ruby itself for doing any of the natural language processing, or if I'm just using it to consume an API? I've played a little bit with like implementing things like Eliza and chatbots and stuff in Ruby, which technically count as NLP. Um, Ruby doesn't have all the libraries that something like Python or Java has built in. And I don't have a PhD in machine learning. It makes me a little sad sometimes. And so I don't, have, I don't necessarily know the right, the right set of tools. And so I chose to use the API because it was faster and easier. And the best part is it's getting better. Um, all, of the, all of the machine learning APIs that we've released are getting better and better and better. Like the Vision One can identify breeds of cats and dogs. Um, why? Because people wanted that. OK, we, we added it. Um, and that means that I'm not responsible for maintaining it as language advances and as technology advances. Uh, I do want to play with it. I actually just did a blog post on some basic machine learning techniques in Ruby. I've got k-nearest neighbors. I've got basic linear regression. There's going to be a couple more showing that you can actually use Ruby for this stuff. But if there's something that exists, coming back to my belief in being fundamentally lazy, uh, I'm going to use the lazy thing. That's my cat, Emma. More cats. <laughs> Do we have any final questions? One last one. I've got yep. one last cat. Go ahead, sir. 
Um, so in English, you can um, say the same thing with different structure, right? So can this um, Google Cloud language understand in intent? So tell me what you are saying with different ways. So the Google Cloud Language API just takes text. We also have a speech API. Um, and there's probably ways to hook those two together to try to understand intent, but mostly what it can use is context. So you can have it understand a single sentence and it may get it wrong. One of my favorite examples is I had it do uh, bunnies hop and it didn't understand that bunnies was a noun in that context. But if I said the bunnies hop and put a period on the end, it all of a sudden understood it because I had additional context. Um, Languages are hard and computers are actually really, really dumb. They're just really, really fast at doing dumb things over and over and over again. So, okay, my last kitten. There you go. Thank you so much, Aja, for the cats, dinosaurs, machine language, and natural language. Thank you so much, guys.